Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Lorraine Cohen Tanuji, who is a French intellectual and author uh, and an international lawyer. His new book is The Shape of the World to Come, Charting, char charting the Geopolitics of a New Century. Loren, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was born in uh, Tunis, Tunisia, in the, the Mediterranean, and uh, spent my childhood there, and which was a, actually a very, very nice country, a very sort of cosmopolitan and, and open country, a little bit like you know, the way you might think of, of Lebanon in the, in the good old days. Uh, then moved to France when I was a teenager, and I've been in, <coughs> based in Paris ever since, but also lived in America for a couple of years uh, and studied, studied here. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, they certainly uh, gave me uh, a great education for one thing. And uh, I remember uh, stories about, about the war in and, and Tunisia. Obviously, Tunisia was less affected that, than, than uh, Eastern Europe. This would be World War II? Or, it would be World War II, yeah. yeah. But I remember the stories of the, you know, the Germans in Tunisia and my father being a, a prisoner and es escaping and, and uh, also the, uh, uh, the value of the, of the uh, American uh, partnership, uh, all those things have, have, have shaped me. Uh, certainly, I mean, America has always been like, uh, uh, together with France, uh, from, from Tunisia, France was the sort of the cultural uh, uh, reference, and, and America were, was the, uh, the, you know, the, the security, the protection, also the admiration of the success. And uh, so those two poles, I think, have shaped me since my, uh, since my childhood. And was there a discussion beyond what you just said of, of politics, of world politics around the dinner table? No, not at all. In fact, uh, we were not, I mean, my, my parents were uh, separated when I was a child, so there was no real, uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I really uh, had that, developed that interest uh, personally and, uh, and always was, was all interested in public affairs and I uh, hesitated for a long time between uh, I actually have uh, sort of a pretty diverse background. I'm supposed to be a professor of literature. Uh, <laughs> I also did political science uh -huh. and then ended up becoming a corporate lawyer. Uh -huh. But I always wrote uh, in parallel and, and on, on public affairs and international affairs. And, and how did you pursue that through your education? I mean, did you, were you, did you do journalism or was it just writing uh, essays as part of the, the public discourse or the life yeah, on the no, campus? Yeah, no, I do, do, I mean, I do write columns uh, from time to time, but I've never actually worked as a journalist. I've always been a, a lawyer for my, for my profession, and I, and I wrote essays on, on, on the side. But it has become a, a second career because one thing led to another, and I'm, I'm spending more and more time uh, you know, lecturing around the world and, and also writing, and I've had several Key subject. Actually, my first book uh, I wrote right after coming back from from the United States when I spent mm -hmm. two years, uh, and and the first book was about the, the comparison of the role of law and, and lawyers in American democracy and in French democracy. I was trying to explain why is law so important in the United States and why was it because that's changed so unimportant in France and in European culture, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's how I started. And, and, but let's go back to your education a minute. So you, you were educated in uh, France and then you said in the United States. Tell us a little about that. What, you majored in literature? Is that what you just said? Or? Uh, yeah, we don't have exactly the same system, but I went to the Ecole Normale Supérieure, which is one of the French uh, grandes écoles, elite schools, and I, I majored in, in literature, uh, but I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to be a, a, a professor or a teacher. And so I, I also, did political science studies and was interested in going to government school. Uh, but then I felt also I had an international fiber and I didn't feel like I wanted to be uh, you know, too constrained in, in, in the French administration. And so I, I, was, um, I decided to go for a more international career and, and a more sort of a, a private sector oriented. Uh, and I think that I wouldn't have been able to write 
these books if I hadn't done that. So I'm a kind of a, uh, atypical uh, animal. If and you and what, what so. uh, you said you studied here in the United States? Yeah. And, and what sort of studies were those uh, legal studies? Yeah, or? I did a master's degree at, at Harvard Law School. Uh, but that was sort of at the end of my, of my study. I'd already done law and political science in France, and so I did a sort of a, a graduate program here. And then I worked in New York City. So, so what uh, is? Are there common themes that run through? You said you've written eight books or so. Uh, uh, com what, what sort of problems have interested you? Well, as I said, I started with uh, this. Really, was a personal inquiry because I really discovered the, the the world of law and lawyers in America. It was something that I had no idea about, and so I started from there. And so it was really about law and democracy. And then from that, I wrote two books on, on, on these topics. And then from that, I, I got interested in European unification, because uh, Europe is primarily a, a legal system that, that has a lot of similarity with the US uh, federal system. And then I got engaged in the, that, that, that book came at, out at the time of the, of the Maastricht referendum. So I got engaged in the campaign, and I became a, a sort of European uh, militant and, uh, and for, for, for Europe, Europe yeah. for Europe and for sort of uh, a political Europe, and so then I, I and I still spend a lot of time on European policy making. And I met Jacques Delors and I, I joined his his think tank and 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 so and the last phase from that I, I moved to transatlantic relation because I'm a, a call, I would define myself as a Euro Atlanticist. In other mm -hmm. words, I don't see any conflict between being for mm -hmm. favor of a strong Europe and also a Europe that is uh, a close partner to, to, to the United States. And so I wrote this book about uh, transatlantic relations of the Atlantic Alliance after September 11, and then this last book about globalization. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm, I'm curious, what, what, what uh, on this intellectual journey, beginning with this comparison of American lawyers and French lawyers, what, 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 did, what, what was the conclusion? And, and how has it informed your kind of understanding of the subtleties of the relationship? The first, about the first book, you mean? Yeah. Well, the first book was really, the, 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 the thesis was that uh, it was in the mid-80s, and France uh, and other parts of Europe wanted to reduce the role of the states in, in their economy and uh, societies. And I guess the message, my message was, if you want to reduce the role of the states, you have to replace it by something else. And that something else is the rule of law. Mm -hmm. and, and the French really didn't have that in mind. They thought about the market. But they didn't really see that the market also needed to um, law and market go together, and that was really the big contribution that that made the book famous. And still today, a lot of people tell me that this book is the one that you know uh, contributed to most to their to their thinking. So that's. Um, do you, uh, you you uh, uh, self-identify as a public intellectual, and that is a term that we used to have here when we had people like Albrecht and Schlesinger and so on. But mm -hmm. but it's less clear that we still have that. So I, I would be curious because you you're you're really moving between realms. You're an international lawyer who does corporate work, but at the same time you're talking about public issues and, and and making important ar arguments about, for example, Europe. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the figure of public intellectual is, I, th I think, is a, is a typically French figure, uh, you know, long tradition you know, of Sartre, Aron, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, even those figures are, even in France, the, the, those figures are, are, are disappearing. I think what's, uh, what's specific to me is that I, I'm, as you said, I'm, I'm, I'm also in the, in the real world, quote unquote. I mean, I'm in the in in, in business, in, uh, uh, but at the same time, I'm, I, I try to uh, reflect on, on on public policy issues, and that that is a, a combination that uh, even in France is, is not very common because uh, uh, lawyers tend to be more and more specialized, and they, they don't really have the the time or the interest of of uh, going outside their their sphere. But I always had this. Uh, Tension. I try to uh, basically continue in my professional career the kind of mix that I had during my mm -hmm. studies, where I always did like three things uh, mm -hmm. at the same time. I it, enjoy that. As as in, in the ideal type of a public intellectual, does that mean somebody who's writing about issues of, of 
concerns of public policy, but uh, and also public education, or are the two separate? Uh, I'm curious about that because that's a there's a void here, I believe, in our country right. uh, for this uh, vocation. I think maybe what distinguishes it that it's uh, you're trying to influence public debate. So it's not only uh, an academic endeavor. You're trying to be a voice. So that that requires being somewhere in the media, uh, either writing or being on. So to, to have a say in the in the in the public debate. So it's not like strictly academic. It's really to to want to influence the debate. Yeah. yeah. So so your new book is the shape of of the world to come. Let me show it again to our audience. Uh, what was your purpose in writing it? Uh, well, I wrote it because I was first of all I was really. Uh, shocked by, by September 11 when it happened. And I felt uh, immediately that this was a turning point. Uh, I thought that the, the world really uh, was, had changed. And, and, and the Europeans didn't feel like that. It took them a while to actually measure, first of all, the impact that it had on, on the United States, but also to also measure the impact it had on. It, it took maybe two years, and I think that part of that disconnect uh, probably explain the misunderstandings about, about Iraq and all the crisis that we've had two or three years later. Uh, but to me, um, it, it was very, very uh, sort of intuitive feeling. And so the book was really to try to uh, explain uh, in what way we were entering into a different world. Not only because of September 11, but there are a number of other elements, uh, but uh, that, we, that basically that the post-Cold War era that had started with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, that parenthesis was over. And, and I was trying, trying to describe the new world that we are entering into and, 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 and make sure the public opinion and political leaders were fully aware of it. Before we go into describing the world and this strange encounter between globalization and geopolitics, uh, as, as a, I, I, I want to ask you because what we had in this country in the 1990s was a debate uh, dominated by uh, Francis Fukuyama's book in which the, the, the idea was that history was over. I'm simplifying now and his book was more complicated, right. but that was the way that it was interpreted by the public discourse. Right. And, and that was because the wall had fallen, democracy was triumphed, uh, uh, along with uh, the market economy. Right. Did, did that view of the world distort uh, uh, our understanding of globalization and, and uh, the dynamic that emerges in which you describe in your book? Yeah, I guess some of the forces that, that I described in the book were obviously already at work. But it's true that we were, uh, during that decade, overwhelmed by you know, the, 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 the end of the Cold War, which was obviously a very positive thing. That, that seemed to be, uh, in fact, a, a spread of democracy in the market uh, around the world. There were hope that Russia was going to evolve into a, a modern democracy and, and market economy. There was the Oslo peace process in the Middle East. There was the internet revolution. A lot of positive things that made us think that you know, we were really entering into a, a happy a happy phase, and but of course during that time, a uh, number of forces were were already at work that sort of exploded uh, at the beginning of the years 2000. And and uh, one of the assumptions of the debate here in the United States, and and some might say that this was a kind of an ideology that the state embraced here in the United States. Uh, to, to, to rationalize the enormous power that America seemed to have in the world with the, with the fall of, of uh, communism. Uh, it was a, a kind of a, uh, the notion that geopolitics was over. Yeah. And, and that, that, uh, uh, that globalization was putting the nail in the coffin. Talk a little about that, because that, that's really a central point that you're making. Yes, absolutely. In fact, even before the, uh, the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, uh, ever since the, the, the detente, really, in, in the, the 80s and the 90s were really the, the two decades where, uh, I mean, that was already at work in the 80s, in other words, that we thought that uh, economics were totally disconnected from, from politics, that there was actually a... Uh, a, um, a, 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 a 
disappearance of, of, uh, of geopolitics that uh, uh, we were really uh, uh, in a sort of um, purely, um, you know, a, a world of market economies and democracies and, and the rule of law and human rights. It was really a happy moment. And, and uh, it was also the time of, the, of what we call in Europe the unipolar moment of American supremacy after the fall of the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so uh, what we are witnessing today is uh, a comeback of, of, of geopolitics, of power strategies, and, uh, and the end of this illusion that economics uh, can be sort of disconnected from politics. And the, the title of the book, for instance, is, is really a sort of reference to Tom Friedman's flat world. And mm -hmm. Becky, what I'm saying is that the world is not flat. And, uh, and uh, we, we can see that it, it is much more complicated than that. But the flat world uh, theory is, is, a, is a basically another uh, expression of, of the end of history, of the liberal uh, dream of that, which is, which is a reality to a large extent, that, that uh, commerce uh, brings or promotes peace and harmony among nations. It's an old idea that uh, uh, since the 18th century or or longer has, has been the dominant uh, idea, and, and again, uh, for, for good reasons. But what uh, we are uh, witnessing today, that globalization uh, does not only bring uh, peace and harmony, but it also uh, brings conflict and fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And that's really uh, a, a change of paradigm from the 80s and the 90s. So, so there's a duality here, a tension yep. between the, the elements that are integrating the world and making us homogeneous, right. but on the other hand, uh, a kind of a resistance to that. Uh, right. uh, there's a resistance, and for the, the example of that is, for instance, the rise of, of, of Islamism, for instance, which you could uh, interpret to, to some extent, I'm not saying it's the whole story, but uh, as, a, as a resistance to the sort of cultural and economic domination of, of uh, Western civilization and of American. I mean, globalization for a long time has been associated with America. It was even in Europe, we call it American globalization or Anglo-Saxon globalization. But there's another phenomenon that globalization is uh, the, uh, the source of an uh, even more important historical uh, shift, which is the rise of new emerging powers in the East, mm -hmm. in Asia, China, India, and, and others. And that is the product of globalization, because mm -hmm. it's by opening their borders, by, uh, the, as, a res as a result of trade liberalization, that, that those giants uh, have finally taken off. Mm -hmm. And so, and that, has uh, his is creating uh, is is uh, 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 causing a, a return of geopolitics uh, through, for instance, the energy question, uh, because the huge demands of of China and, and India for for energy to to uh, fuel their their uh, their growth is is creating you know competition among the consuming countries in Central Asia and Africa, and it's bringing back the, the sort of grand game of the 19th century for mm -hmm. the competition for energy resources. So let, let's break these apart right. because you, you, you're, you, uh, in your book you're identifying uh, and you've touched on two of the destabilizing forces, but let's, let's go to the first one you mentioned and that is uh, uh, the, the emergence of, of Islam as a destabilizing factor in world politics. And, and uh, uh, talk a little about that, because what, what you are showing is that it's not just this confrontation with the West, but the divisions within Islam uh, itself, between Shia and Sunni, between uh, Sunni governments and, and Sunni radicals. And so talk, play that out a little, and, and to what extent is, is globalization uh, a factor that has enhanced that destabilization. Well, uh, as, as as you as you just said, uh, we see you know Islamism. I'm not talking about Islam, obviously, but Islamism and the, the terrorist terrorism factor has been sort of overwhelming and occupying center stage for for, for good reasons. But there are numerous other uh, manifestations. Uh, first, the rise of Islamist parties in, in uh, much of the uh, Arab Muslim world. Uh, 
through sort of democratic means, elections. Uh, there is the, obviously the rise and the, the threat of, of Iran, uh, which has been you know, strongly uh, reinforced by the uh, situation in Iraq, the weakening of Iraq. Uh, there's uh, numerous uh, cultural and religious confrontations uh, between uh, Islam and, and, and Western civilization, in, in Europe in particular, where there's a significant Muslim population. Uh, so all these uh, all these uh, phenomena are are part of the same uh, the same thing. And right now, the situation in the in the Middle East is uh, is not only about you know the Israeli Palestinian conflict, but there are a lot of other conflicts that are, in my view, uh, even more significant for uh, uh, for regional and global uh, stability. And you mm -hmm. know, obviously, Iran is, is is on top of the list, but uh, and it's also frightening to uh, not only to Israel but also to uh, a lot of Gulf states and 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 and, and Sunni uh, countries. So and, and, and importantly, you're you're emphasizing that the combination of the the radical Islamists' capacity to see all these conflicts as coming under one umbrella on the one hand, uh, in response to the American invasion of Iraq. So there is a, a vicious dynamic here right. that certainly burst on the scene where. Uh, conflicts that may be separable uh, have been by the Islam, the extremists, uh, uh, made to appear as if they're one. Yeah, the the the, the, uh, the extremists have a what we might call a, a globalization strategy. In other words, they are they are uh, placing, they are they are making links, and they are uh, putting everything in stage as a, as a, as a global conflict between. Uh, Islam and the West, and of course we must not fall into this trap. But that's their strategy, and uh, and we certainly should not encourage that, that that strategy. And some some mistakes have been made in that in that mm -hmm. in that sense. And so uh, so that's that's clearly one uh, one element of not only destabilization, but there's a there's a risk of a, of a new sort of east-west conflict. And it's probably the last ideological conflict because there's no more ideology in, in, in Russia, for instance. Mm -hmm. But we certainly don't want uh, this religious ideological conflict of new sort to, to take over. I mean, we, we, we need to avoid that. Now, now the, the second destabilizing feature which you mentioned was the rise of the, the uh, these newly industrialized countries, especially Brazil, Russia, uh, uh, China and India, I think they're called the BRICS. Right. And, and it, the, the point that you're making, which is an important one, is that the, the, the mystique of globalization failed to uh, 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 attune us to the extent to which globalization would change the hierarchy uh, in political economic terms. Right. Right, and I would, uh, even though the BRIC countries are usually talked about together, I would really distinguish. I mean, China and India are in a different category than than Brazil and and, and, and Russia. But China, China is uh, the only uh, country that I mean, it's already today the third economy in the world, and is uh, supposed to or expected to become the, the the second and to be at par with the United States, you know, within uh, just a few decades. Uh, already, it has. Uh, it is this, the second uh, <coughs> countries in terms of R and D spending, for instance, ahead of Japan. It is has a third military budget in the world. It's a huge. Uh, it's a huge emerging power, uh, and uh, it uh, also, uh, as uh, I was saying a moment ago, it has a very aggressive strategy of. Uh, trying to uh, find energy resources. It has a, a sort of strategy in Africa, for instance. It's extremely present investing in Africa and, and uh, in Central Asia. And uh, so it is not only an economic phenomenon, but it's, it is clearly a geopolitical phenomenon. And in economic terms, it has uh, huge consequences because of just the mass effect uh, on, on the rise of prices, of energy prices, of raw material prices. All that is to a large extent, the result of the new huge demand of China, India, and, 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 and other countries. So it, it is a tremendous, uh, it, and it's also a historic 
return in a way because mm -hmm. before the industrial revolution in the West, China and India accounted for about 30% of world GDP in the beginning of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And then of course it went down. So it's, it's a return of this, of this empire, uh, the forefront of, of, uh, of history. Mm -hmm. you, you make the point that uh, especially these uh, Russia, Brazil, India, and China are all continental powers, right. which, which means a, a large market. Right. Uh, and as you just said, they're nations with illustrious histories. Right. And uh, they have leaders who want to return and can return to the international stage. Right. If you, uh, they are continental-sized powers. They are a strong nation with a, with, a, with a great history, and you can see a, a return of nationalism. Obviously, mm -hmm. in Russia, for instance, it's, it's obvious. But even China has a very nationalistic mm -hmm. and sovereignist tradition. And uh, you can see how uh, <coughs> Vladimir Putin, for instance, is using the energy weapon to really reestablish Russia as, as, a, as a regional, if not global, power. And so that is, and, and China also has legitimate ambitions to become not only an economic superpower, but also a, a geopolitical uh, power. And so we, that's the world that we are entering into. The expression for that is a, a multipolar world. And for, uh, there were uh, probably some illusions in, in France, in particular, that the multipolar world would be a more balanced, harmonious mm -hmm. uh, world that would be a counterweight to the American hyperpower and, and, and so on and so forth. But what we're seeing that this multipolar world is, in fact, much more unstable and predictable and, and to some extent dangerous than both the unipolar world of the 90s, but even perhaps a bipolar world of the Cold War. And mm -hmm. so we have to now uh, deal with this uh, with this new um, new geopolitical environment. You, you make an important point uh, 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 in your book. You're comparing the, the situation of the West, Europe and the US, versus the, uh, the, the, these new powers, these, these emerging powers. And you say emerging powers have benefited from globalization and can mobilize the masses around it because globalization is associated with prosperity, recovered national pride and more liberties. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so what, what you're suggesting is that these global processes are situating these states to be in a more advantageous position sure. than the West. Sure, I mean, globalization is obviously, I think it's a good thing for, for everybody, including the West, but for uh, China and India, it means you know, hundreds of millions of people coming out of poverty and, and you know making this, uh, becoming a middle class, and, and uh, obviously there's still more freedom than, than there used to be. It's uh, opening up, so it's a, a tremendously positive thing. Uh, it's huge surpluses. Ch China has, uh, I think now, uh, two trillion dollars of, of, uh, of exchange reserves. It's, uh, it's a tremendous uh, boost, uh, and it's true that globalization is a different uh, feeling than, than it has in, in the West, where it's seen more as a, as a threat. Uh, it's certainly the case in, in, in France, for instance, but it's starting to be the case in the United States. So globalization has become, from us being a sort of an American-led phenomenon, is now more synonymous with the rise of Asia and the threat to uh, uh, European and American uh, jobs, uh, which uh, it is to some extent, but globally, uh, it, it is still a, a very positive force, including for the for the West. Uh, uh, before we talk about what's happening in the West, I'm I'm curious because you're somebody who's worked in America and in Europe, and and you've thought about uh, these issues. What what accounts for the myopia uh, that uh, uh, did not help us anticipate these developments. I mean, because it's very important to say, uh, well, globalization is going to change the world, uh, but not kind of realize our, our, on, uh, in the U.S. The, 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 the implications of this. I mean, uh, theoretically, what was wrong with our ideas that we didn't anticipate the kinds of things that you're describing. Is it that you wrote later? What, what is the difference? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, well, I think, again, in the, in the 90s, we were sort of totally uh, self-centered in a way, because it was really the triumph of Western ideas 
we were all into the new economy that was supposed to last forever. We were into uh, spreading democracy around the world. We were into internet and, and, and all those things. Um, and then after that, uh, when things started changing, I think terrorism became the, the center mm -hmm. of attention. Uh, again, for, for, for right reason, but we didn't see that there, there's probably a, historically a more important phenomenon, which is, again, this, the, this shift of, of, of wealth, of, of power. Of course, the energy uh, prices have, have also played a role, and we've witnessed this huge transfer of wealth to oil and uh, gas producing countries and to uh, uh, countries with trade surpluses like, like, like China. And that um, really put, it in, put us in a different game. All the more so because the West itself has had its own setbacks. We, have, we are witnessing uh, a weakening of the West, not only as a mechanical consequence of the, the rise of the, of the East, but also for intrinsic reasons. And mm. so. I think that the, 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 another real uh, signpost of this shift to a new world is the fact that the West is losing its monopoly. We need to, that's really the term that, that uh, the West had a monopoly on, on world affairs for not only since the end of World War II, but maybe since the end of the Industrial Revolution, since the Industrial Revolution. And the, the West, America, and Europe uh, basically led the way in, in everything, in economic terms, and military, uh, uh, cultural, uh, information, science and technology. And, and so we are beginning to uh, see this monopoly uh, eroded and then more and more we will we'll face competition. And we certainly are uh, sort of a minority in demographic terms. Uh, world population is supposed to increase by, I think, 45% by 2050, and then the West will have a, only a very tiny fraction of that, of that increase. Uh, and also economically, we will uh, represent uh, less and less of, of world GDP. And for the first time, you're going to have a, a coincidence of growth and, and economic wealth and population, and that's in Asia. Mm -hmm. you, you identify two uh, 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 points in time that are kind of symbolic turning points for the, the decline of the West or the, the extent to which uh, the, these were really uh, setbacks. One is the Iraq invasion for the United States and, and the failure of that uh, effort, but then also you see in the failure of, of the two European countries uh, to uh, ratify the Constitution as, as a turning point for the European. T talk, talk about especially the, the second one, because uh, uh, you are somebody who, who uh, takes a more critical view of the European experiment. What happened to it and, and why did it go off? Track. Uh, sure. The, 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 the first, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just start by saying that the, 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 there's a paradox at the end of the Cold War, which was supposed to represent the triumph of the West, actually has started to cause to make it more difficult for the West for the transatlantic relationship. Uh, first of all, because the the, 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 the common enemy uh, that federated the alliance disappeared, and so there was a sense of you know what is this alliance still relevant? And so it started to to have more problem in the 90s between Europe and America than than before. Uh, but coming to your to your question, I'm I'm not critical of the European enterprise. I'm just critical of the way it has been. Uh, I, I think that the the, the the key issue in uh, uh, in, in, in European unification is that we have uh, enlarged more and more, we have taken on more and more countries without securing a true agreement on, on, on the project, on you know, what is the ultimate goal, where do we want to go? And so now it is becoming very difficult at 27 countries where you need unanimity to adopt any new treaty and where each country can you know, do a national referendum and. So everything is held hostage to essentially domestic politics, mm -hmm. like we're seeing now with the Irish uh, no vote, which is holding up everything. So that's the problem in Europe. And I was saying that symbolically, uh, and pretty much at the same time, the US got stuck mm -hmm. in Iraq, and 
the Europeans were unable to make the step towards further political, political unification. And those two events at the same time are highly symbolic of the difficulties of the, of the West. There are other phenomena. Uh, take multilateralism. Multilateralism was an invention of the West uh, and, and, a, and a positive invention after World War II, the Bretton Woods Institution, all, all the international organization. And we're seeing that those institutions don't work anymore because of, first of all, the rule of unanimity sometimes, because of the UN traditional issues, and because... And who are the members with what voting powers? Yet? Yeah, and, and also because these new emerging powers are not adequately represented. And so there's a whole uh, challenge of adapting this institution to the new, uh, to the new geopolitical reality. Uh, democracy is also uh, under challenge. Uh, democracy as an embodiment of Western civilization is, is not only is not really uh, triumphing all over the world, but it is in fact more and more uh, contested by other powers or other civilizations. The, the universal, universality of, of, uh, of Western values is, is more and more uh, challenged by others. You, you mentioned, back to this point about the uh, post-World War II in, in institutions, you had a telling phrase where you said uh, the U.S. ambivalence toward these institutions in this latter period, right. and you, you refer to Clinton's benevolent opportunism and Bush's destructive contempt. So in different ways, uh, uh, both American leaders uh, 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 failed to provide the leadership which, in your view, involved adapting those institutions to the new centers of power and the new issues. Yeah, I mean, America has always been very uh, ambivalent about, about this. Basically, uh, it invented the multilateral uh, order uh, after World War II. Uh, but at the same time, it always sort of kept a foot outside. I mean, it was, it was good for the rest of the world, but uh, the United States always kept it's, it's, uh, it's freedom to, to, to act as a sovereign power. And so uh, still today there's a very strong sovereignist uh, tradition in American foreign policy, which makes it actually uh, closer to, to, to China, to Russia. And Europe uh, is really an exception. There's sort of a European exceptionalism in, in trying to uh, go beyond uh, sovereignty, uh, sharing sovereignty, go beyond nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And so uh, America has always been really ambivalent. Uh, and and you, you actually are suggesting later in the book that Europe uh, is, is the European experiment may not be able to deal adequately right. with this resurgence of geopolitics. Right. Talk a little about that. Is it, is it that the European institutions and the culture are too naive about the world as it is becoming? Yes, I mean, the, there, was a, there was a hope uh, at some point, I mean, during this period of the 80s and the 90s, that the world was in fact, uh, that Europe was a sort of postmodern laboratory of world governance, that the world was in fact going to become like Europe, a world where uh, states would share sovereignty and act together for the common good, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what we've uh, witnessed is that uh, instead of Europe spreading its, its model around, uh, the rise of these new uh, powers and the return of geopolitics has in fact uh, isolated Europe. And Europe now has to really adapt itself to the new environment. And uh, it has to think of itself as a, as a power, at least an economic power that has interest that needs to be defended. And it's really not the way the Europeans have been thinking of themselves. They had this sort of idyllic view of, of the world. They basically transposed their own experience of European unification to the rest of the world as if everything was homogeneous. But more and more, we see that not only it's not the case, but we have a return to 19th century politics and geopolitics. And so, what I'm saying is that the world we are entering into will be a dual world. There's the, the, the forces of 
of homogenization, of, of, of peace, of uh, technology. I mean, the sort of Friedman flat worlds, uh, which are there, obviously, fortunately, of interdependence. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also have the conflicting forces of, of, of fragmentation, of, of, uh, of power uh, rivalries. And so it's really the, the crossing of these two dynamics that characterizes the, the, the world we are uh, we are heading to. You, you see America as better positioned than the Europeans for, for ver talk a little about those reasons why, uh, despite mm. America's recent failures of adaptation, that, that we are positioned to adapt in the future. Yeah, I think the, the, the strength of, of, of United States compared to, to Europe is, is one uh, demographics uh, demography because uh, the United States will be the only industrial power, industrialized power, which will have a, uh, a demography that is closer to the new emerging powers of the South. In which other, is a median to, age that's young. Right, uh, yeah. right. Thanks to immigration and thanks to the, the fertility rate of, of, of immigrants in particular. Whereas Europe will see a, a demographic decline and is now uh, confronted with aging of, of its population. And that's a very important long-term trend. Uh, Another aspect is, of course, innovation. I mean, the, the U.S. Is, is still the strongest country in, in R&D, innovation, productivity, and dynamism of, uh, I wouldn't say the financial market, but it's true that mm -hmm. uh, despite the, the vagaries that, that uh, cause the, the crisis today, I mean, the United States is a very dynamic economy. And uh, so that's another. Another strength is, of course, the university. I mean, the U.S. is uh, still the world's university and there will be new competitors. I think China is investing uh, billions of dollars in creating world-class universities, but for quite a while still uh, the U.S. has that advantage, has the English language, has the universal language. So a lot, there are a lot of key assets that the U.S. have and also being an, a nation, mm -hmm. being a continental nation just like China or, mm -hmm. or, or, or Brazil or India, whereas Europe is a continent but it's, it probably never will be a nation. So that's why I think that on the whole, uh, the U.S. is, the problem that the U.S. has is, is le learning to, to share sovereignty because it will be, uh, we're entering a world where there will no longer be a monopoly or even a duopoly with Europe. There will be uh, the need to share power and to engage others. And, and so the U.S. has to learn that because it hasn't been it didn't have to do that in the past. And, and, and for that, Europe is, is better prepared because that's really the European experience to share sovereignty. Mm -hmm. you, you have a, a listing of, of uh, the extent to which uh, uh, politics in the democracies, the, the West, uh, has, has in recent years been failing. Uh, weak support for parties and governments in power, division of the electorate leading to very narrow margins to govern, weak international stature of leaders, triumph of popular opinion over political vision and courage, the rise of populism and extremism, marked provincialism of political class and national debates. It's a kind of a, a general indictment, but if you're right, and they, these ring true, these items ring true, what, what is the key to uh, leadership in the West, assuming the responsibilities that, that you're very powerfully arguing they have to assume. Right. Well, I, I'm, I'm a believer in, um, I'm more a believer in representative democracy than in direct democracy, for instance. And that's something that's quite, um, that's, that's really American uh, rather than, than, than European. And there's a distrust of, of direct democracy and referenda and the like in, in, in United States. And from that, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very American, uh, but generally there is a crisis of democracy in, in throughout mm -hmm. the West, uh, which uh, also uh, strengthened the adversaries of democracy uh, around us. Uh, my sense is that we are in times of you know increasing complexity of of everything, of uh, increasing influence of thanks to globalization of outside events. I mean, you can see today the financial crisis, but there are many other examples where everything is tied together. And at the same time, you have this uh, uh, political impulse of you know, 
participative democracy, grassroots democracy, populism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and my sense is that leadership is really uh, a time where you uh, you take on responsibility. You lead. You, know, you 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 make decision, then you try to convince the people of your vision, but you do not ask them for their opinion and you don't follow their opinion. And take the, the issue of national referenda in Europe. I, I think it's absolutely silly when you are 27 countries. Uh, it's already so difficult to come to agreement on a treaty. There's 27 parties. You have national parliamentary ratification. If you had a third layer of national referenda, mm -hmm. which is totally hostage to domestic politics, it just doesn't make any sense. And so that, that is, that's, that's what I think. It's a, it's a times for, for, for leadership in the sense of having a vision and, 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 and leading and not, uh, but we are in a, in a media democracy where politicians uh, uh, look at the opinion polls every day and, and tend to follow uh, public opinion rather than, than lead. Uh, are you a realist in the sense that uh, uh, you think events will force for example, the United States to see these new realities, and, and here we can bring in the financial crisis because clearly there aren't going to be the resources uh, to do what we might have done before the financial crisis, and it's going to become very, appendant, uh, very uh, apparent that there is an interdependency that, that we've touted but not accepted as a reality for ourselves. Yeah, I think that unfortunately, since uh, the, the for no uh, better means, uh, it is external events that are that are forcing, and it applies both United States and Europe. I mean, United States, September 11 was a real shock that also, uh, you know, showed everybody that something that happened way out in Central Asia and Afghanistan, or places that nobody had ever heard about, uh, had an impact right in the center of, of American power. Uh, same for the financial crisis. I mean, you, if you take Europe, uh, Europe is not a, a federation. We don't have a federal budget. We don't have a treasury. But we had to cope with these emergencies. And last weekend, uh, we were able to coordinate uh, action throughout Europe to, to try to provide uh, you know, a rescue package. And so it is external events that will eventually force uh, further integration, and uh, it, it's a pity that we need that, but uh, certainly uh, in Europe where there's a sort of uh, uh, view that Europe uh, constructs itself through in crisis and through crisis, and, and I think that uh, we, are, we are seeing the same thing here. Do you, uh, were you surprised that Europe led on this package, uh, 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 Europe being right. led by Britain in a way, because uh, uh, the prime minister came up with the solution right. first. Yeah, I mean, I guess you know the the, the U.S. had tried several things uh, in the in the in the past few few days, and uh, it was clear. And I think there was a lot of commentators that that you know said we need really to go straight to the root. We need to bring you know new capital to these banks. We need to restore the credit market, and so. Golden Brown came up with a solution for Britain, and then you know it was adopted by by, by the others. I think Europe has been has been leading. Uh, take also the the Russia Georgia crisis of this summer. Uh, there was uh, you know uh, I mean France has the presidency of the EU today uh, for for this semester, and, and Sarkozy went and you know went to Moscow and negotiated the, the ceasefire agreement and and so on. And so I think Europe has been taking the lead uh, in negotiation with Iran also. The U.S. has been kind of stuck in Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan. So Europe has tried to uh, uh, you know, supply some, 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 some take, take some, some leadership. And uh, I think that's a, that's a positive thing. What, what is problematic is that uh, I don't think that uh, we could have had the same result with uh, for instance, for the, the Georgia crisis, if we had had uh, a former Soviet satellite in the, in the lead of the European Union, which means that we need a, a stable mm. presidency. That's one of the uh, items of the, of the new treaty that we're trying to, the Lisbon Treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a stable presidency that doesn't change every six months. And, and because otherwise, uh, you will have ups and downs depending on, on the, the capacity of each, of each country. So those are the things. And I think that this crisis will, will provide a strong argument in favor of, uh, of uh, 
further uh, institutional reform in Europe. Do, do you, uh, the, these two things, these two items you just mentioned, go against what seems to be the argument in the book that Europe uh, will be marginalized because of the failure of the uh, EU experiment to uh, understand the implications of enlargement? No, I think when I'm talking about marginalization, marginalization it's more uh, in the economy. I mean, there's a, Europe really needs to move forward in, uh, in the uh, knowledge-based economy and in innovation, in, in productivity. Uh, otherwise, it really risks being marginalized in an economy that will have two major poles, the United States on one hand and China and the rest of Asia. And so it's really more a sort of economic uh, effort that, that needs to be, uh, and that was the subject of the, this mission I did for the, for the French government. Uh, it's not really, uh, on, I mean, of course, at the same time, Europe also needs to assert itself in the world and, and, and have a, a real foreign policy and then increase its defense budget, all those things. But we've sort of made progress in that, but I'm mainly thinking of, of the economy. Looking ahead, uh, you, you know, uh, the result of reading your book is there, there are a number of problems out there that are going to have to be addressed. The rise of China uh, and its integration in, into the global system. The, you know, the, this whole problem of, of the destabilizing factor of elements of Islam uh, and so on. Uh, uh, in addition, these uh, newly emerging powers have a very different view of the kind of system they want, as you discussed. What, what is leadership from the West going to look like in addressing uh, those problems, and, and where are the places where they will be addressed in, in the international arena? Right. Well, first of all, I, I want to say that I, I do not view this as a, as a negative evolution. It's something we just need to be aware of. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the rise of China and India uh, from in sort of humanitarian terms, I mean really the rise out of poverty of, of uh, hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and it's also good to have more cultural diversity, etc. So, but uh, I think the priority for the West is to, obviously as it has, has done before, is to really engage those new players in the multilateral system to continue having a, a policy of openness, of engagement. Take climate change, for instance, we can't do anything on climate change without India and China. Uh, some of the other geopolitical crises, we need Iran, North Korea, we need the support of China and Russia. Uh, for climate change, we need <laughs> the support of the United States, of course, as well. But. Uh, so that's the, but at the same time, we need also to remain vigilant because, again, uh, there, historically it's been very rare to see economic power without political power and military power. And again, we're in a world of, of, of with new non-Western forces, non-democratic forces. So we need to maintain at all times, in my view, the, and that's maybe coming back to the childhood influence, we need to maintain the strategic superiority of the West, of democracy, at, at all times. But provided that this is maintained, we, we need to do everything we can to you know, engage and, and create a new multi multilateral order that's really the the priority of the day. It's a new international institution. We need to engage the uh, Arab Muslim world in economic globalization and democratic modernity. We need to fight these global hazards, uh, proliferation, uh, pandemia. We, we need to address, and the US has to obviously uh, restore its leadership role and its uh, international credibility, its soft power to do that. Uh, that, that is absolutely uh, an essential task of the next president. Mm -hmm. uh, one final question, and that is, what role does international law play in this? I mean, I know that you do corporate law, right. but but is international law key to building uh, the the in rebuilding and rejuvenating the in international institutions? Yes, I mean, first, there's a, the, the the first priority is is really to have institutions that are that are both representative of the new uh, balance of, of power and, and, and efficient, that, that uh, can make decisions. 
uh, we do have a, a body of international law uh, that is, you know, obviously needs to be updated, but, but that is not, in my view, the, 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 the priority because we, we have that. We, we just need to make, to be able to, to make decisions that are, that are efficient and, and, and legitimate. But of course, yes, I mean, the goal is to uh, arrive at a world that is governed by, by the rule of law and not by, by force, uh, obviously, and we had that and we had a lot of progress, for instance, in, in international criminal uh, justice, for instance, that has been a real uh, uh, breakthrough in the past uh, 20 years, the uh, criminal court of justice, etc. But uh, at the same time, we must not be naive because we are, we are in a world of, of, of power and, and, and interest. And so Europe, for instance, can no longer simply, you know, uh, plead in favor of, of, of peace, uh, the rule of law, etc., in a world that functions differently. So we, we need to adapt to that too. We need to be realistic as well. Well, Lauren, I, I want to thank you for coming on our program and I for writing this book and, and uh, sharing your observations with us. And let me show the book again uh, to our audience, The Shape of the World to Come, Charting the Geopolitics of a New Century. Uh, thank you again thank you. for being here. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.